students and also uh, Amadeo uh, uh, Napoli, so Guillermo Alves, uh, Vaishnavi Bhargava, uh, myself and Amadeo Napoli. And basically what we are going to talk is about, is about um, so it's a, it's a theme or a topic that, um, that it's quite, uh, uh, it's quite uh, on the, the, the um, nowadays uh, uh, concerns of several groups, in particular after the, the G G GDPR, uh, um, the, the law on, um, on uh, data protection, and uh, which require exactly that um, artificial, artificial agents uh, they should be able to provide explanations and also they should uh, kind of make sure that um, the results or the decisions that they make, uh, they are kind of fair. So as we see, uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, notions that are fairly, um, that are rather um, subjective, such as that of, uh, of fair, of uh, what does it mean for a model or for an agent to be fair. And essentially here, we are going to take the, the, the kind of the classical view on this, uh, on this matter that it is uh, that a fair model, model should be uh, a model that to some extent takes into account uh, salient groups, minorities, and uh, kind of works against uh, discrimination, yeah? So by discrimination, we once again are going to take uh, kind of the, the, um, the, the usual view that discrimination basically refers to unjust or prejudicial a treatment of different uh, category, uh, categories of people, uh, especially uh, based on um, uh, features such as race, age, or sex. And that is to say, this kind of salient features, yeah? So as I have mentioned, this is particularly a serious topic if we are talking about uh, decision-making processes, um, because usually they have a, a, a strong impact uh, on humans. And of course, humans are well known to have both uh, or to apply both uh, an objective and a subjective uh, reasoning. So uh, many people have been working in order to uh, kind of automating uh, decisions in order exactly to uh, take away this subjective aspect, uh, which is very typical in humans. We are filled with biases that, uh, that shouldn't exist when we are making uh, decisions, yeah? So... <clears throat> These algorithmic decisions, they are supposed to be objective because they are based on data and uh, they are algorithmic processes. So there shouldn't be uh, any bias or they should be rather fair, but the truth is that they can also be prone to biases. And uh, the common sources for this are um, either on the data collection uh, phase or then on a choice of algorithms and therefore the models that they um, that they train, yeah? So data collection in the sense that if your data is already biased, of course, the, the, the models that you will uh, train using this data, data will also have this, yeah? Now, this would not be a problem uh, if there wasn't, uh, or if this algorithms or this kind of uh, artificial agents weren't being used um, uh, and applied on uh, critical aspects of, uh, of uh, or dealing with, uh, with humans and society as a, as a, as a whole. So we now have several, ap several um, applications that deal with, uh, for instance, the, the, the prediction of credit card uh, defaulters, also making decisions on uh, job applicants. One typical or one uh, well-known example is that of Compass. And uh, so that is to say uh, a system for predicting uh, the critical uh, criminal uh, recidivism, that is to say, criminals that will um, commit, again, uh, crime. So trying to predict this, and here, for instance, what was observed was that the system that was being used in, uh, in the US, which was called uh, Compass, in fact, people noticed that there was uh, a racial bias uh, towards the black uh, community, yeah? So essentially, the, the, the predictions uh, the, the rates in the predictions were basically the same, but the false positives were uh, much higher for the black community than for the, the, um, the white community. Yeah? So there are several of these uh, uh, kind of uh, drawbacks and some of which are this kind of uh, negative impacts that this uh, algorithmic uh, procedures um, may have. And, uh, and of course, this raises several concerns and uh, because this kind of uh, unfair decision-making or um, this, this kind of unfair outcomes that can come 
from uh, artificial agents, uh, well, they not only affect the human rights, but they also kind of undermine the, the, um, the, the public uh, trust in machine learning and artificial intelligence, yeah? Okay, so now concerning this, uh, this um, concerning the, the, the decision outcomes, of course, fairness, uh, again, in this uh, artificial setting, uh, uh, can be uh, defined with respect to, or can be assessed with respect to essentially two different approaches uh, to, to, to assess it. So one is by using certain uh, fairness metrics. Uh, we are going to see several um, in the course of this, uh, of this presentation. Another one is of course to, 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 to question whether uh, the model uh, relies on certain features, salient features, uh, which are discriminatory. Uh, typical examples, as I mentioned, are uh, features such as race, age, or sex, yeah? Now, there are two main approaches to dealing with this type of uh, machine learning um, biases or unfairness. So the first one is, of course, to enforce certain fairness constraints. So you have this, uh, this uh, fairness matrix and kind of you try to, um, to impose certain fairness constraints while training. So this is, again, an example that actually comes uh, from this COMPA, uh, COMPAS data set. So here we are, um, we are uh, requiring that the false positives for the, the blocks should be the same as or in proportion uh, comparable to the false positive for the whites, yeah? So of course, this is for, the, for uh, the, the feature race, but you could see many other, many other uh, fairness constraints that could be employed. But of course, this has a drawback, which is that if you require so many constraints um, during training, then the training process will be very, very heavy. And then, of course, this has a, an explosion in complexity, but also it could very well happen that you are just overfitting your system, or then you are just jelly, uh, you are picking uh, certain, uh, so you are, you are doing what is called as fairness gerrymandering, yeah? So these are the drawbacks. Now, another approach that you can have uh, is of course to deal with the second type of, uh, of fairness, which is, which is process fairness, which is to exclude those features which are considered uh, discriminatory. Yeah. So, for instance, in the case of Compass, basically you would exclude from your data set the information about uh, the race. Yeah. Now, this is nice, and you could uh, apply this all over, and and basically your system would not. Uh, be dependent on this sensitive feature, but uh, the, the problem is that if you remove too many of these features, then what happens is that uh, you experience a decrease in, uh, in accuracy because your machine does not have enough information to learn, yeah? So <clears throat> this is true, but uh, as we are going to see, there are ways of dealing with this, and it's a little bit about this uh, two types of problems that I'm going to focus. Uh, I won't have too much time to get into the in the first one, but I will present several several things about um, about uh, fairness metrics. But I'm going to focus on the second one, which is process fairness. Yeah. So our goal was to was to the original goal was really to uh, kind of propose a human centered approach to reduce uh, a model's reliance on sensitive feature. And I will say what do I mean by human centered um, approach. And if, in fact, our proposal is basically a, a framework which consists of two parts. So the first part is just to assess whether a model is fair. And of course, assessing this is just to see whether it relies or its outcomes uh, depend uh, deeply on or strongly on uh, sensitive features. And then if the model is, um, is, uh, is uh, deemed to be uh, fair, nothing uh, to do. If it's deemed to be unfair, then trying to propose another model which resembles the original one, but which is much uh, fairer, yeah? Of course, all of this without uh, compromising the model's um, accuracy, yeah? So the idea for, uh, for tackling the first one uh, that we had was, uh, or actually we are not the only ones using this idea, was to use kind of uh, explainers in order to assess the model's dependence on um, on uh, sensitive features, yeah, and uh, and of course we use explainers which are based on a feature or that output uh, feature importance, so that we could have an idea what is the the, um, the model's dependence on sensitive feature, yeah. So there are several examples that nowadays it became quite well known. 
One is Lime. Uh, you also have a more recent one, which is Sharp, and you have different approaches which are based on uh, gradient um, or, in fact, salient, uh, salient maps. But of course, this requires some further uh, assumptions. Yeah. So in this work, or in the work that I'm going to present, because we have been uh, playing with uh, other um, other um, other explainers, I'm going to present you some results concerning Lime which stands for local interpretable uh, model agnostic uh, explanations, which as the model, as the name says, it's uh, kind of a, a local uh, approach to providing, um, to providing uh, explanations, yeah? So I guess that most of you have at least heard about LIME. So LIME is a local uh, method that essentially, so when you have, um, so it kind of explains the classification of instances, yeah? And uh, essentially what it does, it kind of looks into um, kind of a, a neighborhood of the instance that you are trying to explain. And what it's going to do is to try to learn a simple, a simple model uh, that, um, that then will allow to explain uh, this classification. So the simple model that uh, Lime, um, that Lime uh, learns is a linear model. And, uh, and of course the linear model and it learns this on a neighborhood of, uh, of the instance that you are trying to explain. So the advantage is that the learning is quite fast. And also, uh, if you look at the structure of a, of a linear model, essentially you have um, a weighted uh, sum of variables. And of course, these weights can be used as the contribution of a given, um, of a given feature to the, the output of the model, yeah? So this is basically the idea behind the uh, line. So uh, displayed in figure one, I'm giving uh, one example or one explanation for a prediction of, um, of, uh, of a model. So here it's a local, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's an example taken from the adult data set that we are going to, to talk about a little bit uh, later on. And then it makes a, a prediction. So essentially it tries to predict whether um, a given, uh, a given um, instance in this case, it's a human being, uh, whether it's going to, to, um, to have a salary which uh, uh, exceeds or not uh, 50K per year. So it's salary prediction. And this is basically the type of um, explanations that line produces. So you have, different, um, you have different features such as capital gains, such as relationship, and then it kind of shows the contributions to each one of, of the classes, yeah? Okay, but we will talk about examples a little bit later and I will just uh, keep, on, keep on going. So the idea, uh, as I said, was to use, uh, was to use um, an explainer in order to assess, um, to assess the model uh, uh, fairness. And essentially what, uh, what we propose is a system that uh, has as input three things. So a model, a data set, and the set of sensitive features. And this is why we, we refer to our, our approach as human-centered because it's the human that, um, that still have a role to play in the system. And then as output, it will output the same model if it's deemed to be uh, fair. Otherwise it will output um, another model, which is based on this one, but uh, which is much more fair. And on top of it, which will not compromise too much the, the accuracy of uh, your model, okay? So what we proposed was to kind of use as explainer in this one. Uh, we do have other systems that use other types of explanations, but, uh, uh, but I, will, I will talk about this later. So in this one, uh, we use line and essentially it contains then the two components. So the first one um, is for providing global explanations because uh, line is still a local approach. And then having a kind of a, an ensemble approach, which I will explain uh, is based on feature dropout in order to kind of um, play a little bit with this uh, or be able to, to, to handle this drop of accuracy, which is typical if you start to removing uh, features, yeah? So here I put um, uh, one of the first uh, repositories. So this was our, our, original, um, our original repository, but I will, uh, later on, especially in the article, it, we will provide other um, other repositories. Okay, so going for uh, for the two components. So we have the line global, which is to provide line, uh, global explanations, and we have the other one, which is an ensemble uh, approach. Okay, so going for a line global, 
So the idea was that, of course, this feature importance or this explainers, which are based on feature importance, they can provide uh, quite, a, um, quite an insight into uh, the dependence of models uh, on certain features, yeah? So this is why we started playing with line, but the problem is that line provides local explanations. That is to say, explanations for each one of the, the, the features, uh, each one of the, the instances, yeah? You give me an instance and I explain the classification or the prediction for that uh, instance by looking at the neighborhood. So this is problematic for us because we need kind of global explanation. And in order to do this, the idea was to use, um, was to kind of uh, use sampling in order to uh, kind of pick a couple of, uh, of instances whose explanations to some extent have a good coverage on the, the whole data set and they are sufficiently um, diverse in order to avoid redundancies, yeah? So here in this uh, preliminary study, we kind of basically uh, use submodular peak with a configuration um, kind of out of, the, out of the box. And then the output of this, uh, of this system is just uh, a set of K most important uh, features, but here, instead of being local, it's kind of uh, global, okay? So these are the, the, the type of ranking of uh, importance or the, the, the feature importance that we are going to use. And once again, uh, just as a preliminary, uh, preliminary uh, work, we kind of um, used uh, K equals to 10, yeah? So then the rule would be that if among the top, top K uh, features, uh, we find uh, features that were uh, given by the, the a user that was that were considered to be uh, sensitive, then the model is deemed to be unfair. Otherwise, it doesn't do anything. Yeah, and if it's considered unfair, then uh, there is the second component that applies, which is uh, we call it uh, ensemble out. So, how does ensemble out uh, work? So essentially, so the first component will output uh, will output the k most important uh, features. And uh, if it happens that among these K uh, most important features, we detect sensitive features among this, then what the second component of uh, LIMAUT does is to train uh, I plus one uh, classifier. So if we had I of these features, uh, if they were uh, sensitive, then LIMAUT will, will train I plus one uh, classifiers by the so-called feature dropout, which is nothing else than basically train the model without taking into account uh, the features. So it will train I models uh, obtained by removing the, the um, one of these features, and then it will still train an additional model, which is obtained by removing all of these uh, sensitive features that were indicated by the first component, okay? By um, line global, okay? And then as the, as the output, we, we provide, or the system provides an ensemble classifier, which once again, in the preliminary experiment was very, very simple. And it's just an average of all the classifiers of this I plus one classifiers, yeah? Okay, so then we tested our, uh, our approach on, um, on, uh, on kind of uh, several uh, data sets. So here I'm, uh, I'm, um, I'm illustrating three of them. So one was the, the adult data set, which, uh, which contains uh, information on uh, it's exactly the example that I that I mentioned about earlier on, which is uh, which is a data set that contains information on um, on U.S. citizens and their uh, salaries. So here the goal, as I have also mentioned, was to predict whether uh, uh, the the salary of the citizen is going to be uh, more than 50k a year. And uh, for this data set, we considered as um, or the features that were considered as sensitive was uh, sex, race, and marital uh, status. Now, we also considered another, um, another uh, data set. This time, this one you can find easily in the UCI repository, which is uh, the German credit card uh, score. So essentially, it contains applicant profiles, so containing uh, demographic and socioeconomic um, information about, uh, about applicants. And, uh, and uh, the, the goal here is to predict whether they are likely or unlikely to uh, pay their uh, credits, yeah? So for this data set, uh, kind of the sensitive features that were, um, that were uh, identified was uh, that they were status X, uh, telephone, and foreign worker. Uh, telephone, I guess that um, people could find this interesting, but uh, the, the motivation was that um, 
an applicant is not or should not be forced to provide uh, certain information such as uh, uh, his uh, telephone uh, uh, details, but I will discuss about this a little bit later on. And there is yet another um, data set. We, we, we experimented with several, uh, but they, here I'm just mentioning these three. So which is this um, law school admissions council, yeah? So again, it contains this time its student profiles, uh, demographic and socioeconomic uh, information about uh, students. And here the goal is to, or was to predict whether a given law school uh, students uh, will pass the bar exams, okay? So this data set also contains information about kind of the, the path of the student. Um, so on other uh, examinations. And here, the kind of sensitive features that were identified were uh, race and sex, yeah? Now, as models, we have been playing with several models. So here I'm going to present some results concerning logistic regression, random forest, some boosting methods such as uh, other boost and bagging. And we also have um, uh, played with uh, neural nets. And, um, but well, I will discuss about these results later on, yeah? Okay, so just to illustrate how does Lime out uh, work? So we are going to pick um, going to pick uh, an example, which is uh, random forest, which is applied on German credit card score. So on this uh, data set. So again, the goal here was to predict whether uh, a loan application can be uh, approved. Uh, that is to say, whether the applicant is likely to pay his uh, his credit. So using random forest almost out of the box uh, with implementations uh, that were given in scikit-learn, um, we were able to um, we were able to obtain um, kind of a fair enough result. So of course, since the the um, since this data set is uh, quite unbalanced, we had to apply some uh, oversampling. We use uh, the, the smooth uh, technique, and also we had to implement some uh, threshold uh, tuning while training. But once again, we used kind of out of the box uh, implementation by on, on uh, scikit-learn. And um, using this, uh, this configuration, we were able to obtain an accuracy of uh, 78, um, so 0.78, which is uh, quite acceptable. But the question, of course, for us is always whether this uh, such a model, even though it has um, kind of acceptable accuracy results, whether the model is fair, yeah? So for that, what we did, once again, we applied the uh, Lime out. So the first component of the Lime out is Lime Global, just to assess, um, just to assess the fairness of, uh, of the model. So this, um, this, uh, the, the results by Lime Global, as we have said, is a list of the most important uh, features. So in this case, the, the top 10, the top 10, um, uh, the top 10 uh, important features were the ones that are displayed. And we see that among these, there are two of the sensitive features, namely foreign worker, uh, which has the highest contribution, and also the telephone, which has a, a fair uh, contribution, yeah? So this means that uh, Lamout will consider this model unfair because there are two uh, sensitive features that played an important role in uh, in the outcomes um, in the outcomes of this uh, of this model. So this means that the second component applies. Yeah. So in the second component, what happens is that we are going to train uh, a pool of classifiers. So each each classifier obtained by removing one of the sensitive features and then by removing all the sensitive features. So that is to say, we will have uh, one model that is uh, trained after removing the, 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 the sensitive feature for a worker, another model after removing the sensitive feature telephone, and then a third model uh, which is obtained by, or which is trained by removing the two uh, sensitive features, yeah? Of course, what happens is that um, is that when we move the two, we have a slight drop of uh, of accuracy, uh, but this was already expected. And uh, and when we trained the, the ensemble, what we realized uh, is that uh, the accuracy uh, raised uh, again. So this is kind of a natural because this was our intuition behind this uh, this framework was really to remove the features in order to re, um, kind of decrease the dependence of the model on sensitive features. But then again, in order to prevent 
the, 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 the accuracy drop, we applied an ensemble approach in order to uh, make sure that the accuracy does not, there was not such um, a big drawback in accuracy, yeah? the, the loss of accuracy. Okay, so then looking at the, the model and kind of checking whether the model is fairer, and this here, the, the kind of the idea or the, the notion of fairer was dependence on sensitive feature. So looking at the results that we obtained, so we clearly see, well, first of all, telephone no, no longer play a role uh, or no longer appears in the top uh, 10. And even the, the foreign worker that still appears in the top 10, we see that its importance or its contribution to the, um, to the, to the outputs of this uh, classifier decreased drastically. So here uh, uh, divided by um, by more than uh, than six, yeah. That is to say, if we take uh, uh, process fairness into account, then this model is indeed uh, fairer, and the accuracy did not actually su uh, suffered any uh, decrease, yeah. Okay, so we did the same thing with a different other example. So here we see the results, for instance, for other boost, and here there is an interesting thing because. The accuracy of the original model, actually it's a little slightly worse than the accuracy after removing uh, two of the sensitive features. So these were the ones that appeared once again in the, um, in the, in the that is to say that the, the, the contributions of the, um, of the features in the original model. So we see marital status and we see sex, which were considered as sensitive features. So when we apply uh, Lima to this, uh, to this uh, model, um, data set and also the set of sensitive features, we get an improvement. Once again, the, the sensitive features have a much less contribution or then they just uh, disappear uh, as a whole. We did the same thing. Uh, a third example was to test what happened with bagging on the, um, the law school uh, data set. And uh, here, Again, the accuracy of the, the original model suffered a little, a little, that is to say the accuracy suffered a little bit when we remove uh, the sensitive features that appeared in the, in the top 10. And, uh, but then again, when we applied the, the second component of line out, uh, that is to say we applied the same symbol approach, the accuracy uh, raised again. So that is to say we get once again um, a fairer model, which on top of it is even more accurate, yeah? Okay, so this were just uh, uh, playing with uh, this kind of notion of fairness, which is based on, um, on uh, reliance on uh, sensitive feature. Um, but of course, one could ask whether, uh, whether uh, what happens with, uh, ah, okay, so here it's just a, an overview also with other, with other data sets. So we also consider this data set, which, is, um, which, uh, which contains information of uh, US uh, mortgages, which is uh, Old Mortgage Disclosure Act that tried to prevent kind of um, some, uh, some uh, that tried to prevent some bad practices in uh, loan attribution. And uh, so here the, the, the goal was to predict whether loans were being high priced and uh, there was the, the, the sensitive feature which we can all uh, agree on. And then there was yet another, um, another uh, uh, data set which is very close to the German credit card, but this time concerning the Taiwanese uh, credit card users, but essentially the, the, the goal were the same, checking or predicting whether payments will be, whether um, users will, um, will uh, default on their payments and uh, the sensitive features are exactly uh, the same. Yeah, so this is kind of a, a, an overview with different um, with different uh, classifiers, uh, but of course, and we observed always the same, uh, always the same principle. We did the same thing also with uh, with neural nets, and we obtain uh, more or less the same um, the same results. But of course, this is dealing or looking at fairness of models, uh, model fairness as being the dependence on sensitive feature. Yeah, and we have seen already that there are uh, other metrics that could be used, yeah? And this is what I want to talk about in the remaining type of my, and the remaining time. I think that I still have 20 minutes, am I correct? Hello? Um, hello, yes, yes, you are correct, but uh, remember that we need some time for questions. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. so I will try to, to kind of wrap up because I just want to 
to quickly go through uh, some of the fairness metrics that are uh, usually um, used uh, in the literature. So the first one is a very simple one, which is demographic parity. So essentially you are requiring, uh, okay, I don't explain where are the, okay, so you are basically having, the idea is that you have uh, privileged groups, unprivileged groups, and you try to ensure that the proportion of uh, positives in the, uh, in the unprivileged groups is rather, it's uh, close to the one in the privileged groups, yeah? Uh, so this is kind of a, a natural measure uh, of, uh, of fairness. Another one that is very used uh, in the literature is the equal opportunity. That is to say that the true positives for the unprivileged groups is the same as the, the or close to the one of the, the, the privileged uh, groups. So this, um, this measure is usually referred to as equal uh, opportunity, also appears under the name disparate uh, mistreatment. So for instance, the, the, the groups could be the blacks or the, the whites, uh, or then it could be, for instance, uh, US citizens or Europeans. It, it, the, 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 the privilege is then to be uh, defined. But there are several other metrics. So another one is the equal accuracy. So here, basically, we are requiring that um, the true positive and the true negatives for the unprivileged group should be in proportion, should be similar to that of the, the privileged group. We also have predictive uh, equality. That is to say that uh, the false positives for the, it's very similar to the one of the true positives, but uh, um, the, the, the false positives for the unprivileged is uh, kind of the same then for the, 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 the privileged ones. And we still have another fifth, uh, which is widely used uh, measure, which is that of group fairness, in which we uh, require that the proportion of uh, positives for the privileged and the unprivileged should be more or less the same, yeah? So these are five that we have considered, but there are still some others, but they are just variants of, uh, of this. And essentially, looking at the, the results, essentially what we did was that we took the, 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 the sensitive measures, we, we took several uh, uh, large pool of uh, classifiers, and what we used was uh, taking the sensitive uh, features as those that would determine the, the, the sensitive from the, the sorry, the, the, the privilege from the unprivileged uh, uh, groups, okay? So for instance, here, um, what is indicated here is that, well, first of all, is for the disparate. I recall once again the the um, I recall once again the, the the name of this. So democratic uh, demographic parity uh, equal uh, equal uh, opportunity here equal accuracy uh, predictive equality and uh, and the last one is uh, disparate impact yeah so okay basically what this says is that uh, we here we are looking into the model which is the other boost that took uh, the the foreign worker uh, feature as being the one that will separate the, the the privileged group from the unprivileged groups yeah and then what we have is that the the, the red balls are the, the, the results obtained by our ensemble approach and the, the, the blue ones are the, the, the original results, yeah? And then, of course, looking into these measures, uh, we, indicated, uh, we indicated as um, this kind of dashed line uh, the, the, the optimal result, so to speak, the one that we should, uh, so for instance, uh, um, the, 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 the balls which are closer to the dashed lines are those that obtain the, the, the best results, yeah? So as we can see, most of, most of the results, they get improved when, uh, when, uh, when we apply our ensemble approach. That is to say that, um, that our models, in fact, even with respect to all of this fairness matrix, um, they, there is this tendency that the results tend to improve, yeah? Of course, there are some exceptions. And, uh, and here we see that, for instance, uh, for the foreign, uh, uh, for this one here, the foreign working using uh, bagging, it's kind of uh, the, the original obtains a better result, but in general, we obtain uh, better results using the, the, the ensemble um, than with this, okay? So this, uh, this kind of fact gets repeated and repeated. Uh, in fact, in this case, uh, we see that uh, there is no, no 
there is no impact on uh, on the the, the, the fairness uh, metrics because the original model is essentially has essentially the with respect to this fairness me metric um, has essentially the same uh, results. Sometimes it improves, sometimes it uh, it gets um, or in most cases it improves, but sometimes it uh, reduces a bit. And then here we have an interesting thing because, in fact, this um, the for the LSAC uh, the models that we considered. Uh, for instance, the ADA uh, for the, the sex feature, uh, it was already uh, fair, but for the other features, it was, uh, it was, um, it was uh, a bit unfair like here. But what we see is that our ensemble approach is capable of improving this, um, each one of these metrics with respect to this, um, with respect to this, uh, uh, to this data set, yeah? Okay, so with this, uh, in order to have time for questions at the end, so I will just uh, move on to the final remarks and then I leave for the questions things that I, I left, um, I left uh, unexplained. And I'm terribly sorry if I did so, but it's still quite bizarre to have, uh, <laughs> to have this kind of online, even though it's very nice and I, I do like, but uh, I don't see you and that is a bit disturbing sometimes. Okay, but I move on to my final remarks. So just to, to say a few words about Limeout, and again, I say that we are working um, on different extensions. So, but what we managed with this uh, Limeout was to show that we can use uh, uh, explanations, uh, local explanations, transform it into global explanations in order to assess model fairness. We also showed that it is possible with, uh, with an ensemble approach, which is basically obtained by uh, first constructing a pool of classifiers using feature dropout and then applying uh, a, even a very simple ensemble approach is capable of uh, providing models which are uh, fairer in the sense that they are less dependent on, um, on sensitive features, but also they have better outputs with respect to different fairness metrics. And it is possible to do so without compromising too much uh, the accuracy. And, uh, and again, this simple idea of uh, feature dropout, in fact, this, is, uh, the, this was uh, inspired by what is being done uh, in, um, in uh, what is being done uh, concerning uh, deep approaches in order to assess, um, in order to be able to assess the uncertainty of the, the, the outputs. Um, so this kind of uh, dropout, the idea comes exactly from that. Uh, and again, what, what uh, so the, the, the kind of the, the punchline is that this simple approach is capable of improving uh, the models, um, the models uh, uh, outputs uh, with respect to process fairness, but also with respect to other fairness metrics. And just a few words concerning um, what we are doing and what we expect to provide in a very short uh, future is that, uh, well, first of all, we are working on several extensions of this uh, Limeout. And these extensions come from the fact that we are using different explainers and also we are playing with different um, uh, data types. Uh, also, another, another point that uh, would deserve some improvements is that, uh, well, in our simple approach, as you saw, we used a very, very simple kind of straightforward um, straightforward rule of aggregation. So our aggregation is quite simple. It's just uh, an average sum. And, uh, but of course, here we should take into account as well the contribution of each one of the features. And this should play a role in the weights that we give to the different, um, to the different classifiers that, um, that are in the pool of classifiers obtained by feature dropout. And of course, there is a lot of space for automation. And uh, one of them is, of course, to um, because our approach is human-centered. Humans need to provide or to indicate what do they consider a sensitive feature. And of course, this is context-dependent and also it's task-dependent because uh, for some tasks, some features, for some data sets could be considered sensitive, but for some other task, it's not uh, sensitive. So this. For the time being, we are still uh, basing ourselves on uh, the human intervention, but of course there could be space for automating this process of uh, selecting uh, the features which are considered sensitive and in particular uh, of choosing how many features should be taken into account when we provide the ranking of the most 
important feature yeah so with this i think i kept myself uh, on time and i would like to thank you for um, for the time that you devoted to to my presentation yes so spasibo za i don't know if i said it like i should <laughs> uh, спасибо за внимание <laughs> So it sounds like спасибо за внимание. Thank you, uh, Miguel, for this um, nice, interesting uh, talk on fairness aspects in uh, machine learning. Uh, personally, I like uh, this way of thinking on uh, uh, interpretable models just because for us uh, who are practitioners, interpretability make, uh, ma makes much sense when we would like to know what are the most important features. But fairness is somewhat connected, but another aspect of the problem. And it brings uh, other insights uh, in understanding the data and the model behavior. Uh, so I like it very much. I also noticed that uh, your work was based on Lime, uh, which can be used, as far as I remember, both for local and global explanations. Uh, um, so uh, since it's time for questions, maybe I can ask uh, the first question. <clears throat> Uh, do you consider also such techniques as Shapley values um, in your, um, uh, how to say, future prospects, maybe? Yes. In fact, we are already uh, playing with, uh, with Sharp and we obtained similar results. Here, I just decided to, to focus on this. Uh, actually, in the paper that, uh, that, we will, uh, that will then uh, appear for this, uh, for this volume, we, we, we focused again on Lime, but we already indicated the, the extensions. And also that the repositories will contain uh, these extensions to other type of explainers such as uh, Sharp. Yeah? Of course, there are several others which are based on, on gradients, but here uh, we need to require that um, the, the function that is learned by your, uh, by your, by your uh, algorithm, of course, this function should, be, uh, should have the good characteristics such as differentiability and all of this. Yeah? So, so if you don't require this, then, uh, and if you are um, uh, basing yourself, yourselves on this uh, kind of feature importance, then I guess that sharp and line would be the most uh, indicated, yeah? And uh, in very few, uh, so in this uh, platform fix out that will, make, will be made available quite soon, um, you will find all this, um, all this, uh, all these things, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, let us provide uh, the possibility to ask questions uh, for our participants. I know that uh, some of them are uh, watching this video via uh, live channel on YouTube, but those who are in Zoom, you are invited, you are kindly invited to ask questions. So questions from the audience, please. If any, there is Leonard. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Miguel, for the nice presentations. So, uh, I have once uh, I don't know if it's a question or an observations. So, the data that you are working with are real data, right? Yes, and they are freely available. Yes. So this means that the, on the training data, the decision was already made. But do you know if the decision was made using the uh, this sensitive uh, feature that you remove or not? Because at that time, we can think as if the data is already having a bias or not. Yes. So that, that, that is one of the, the, the aspects. That's what happened with, uh, with Compass, for instance that there is a big uh, due to unbalanced uh, data and uh, with, uh, with the positives and the negatives, um, that you have this kind of thing. And this is why when we were doing our experiments, we, even though the data sets, they contain already these biases, but as you remember, I, uh, wait a second, I'll put my 
I'll put my, my slide, we applied this kind of um, oversampling in order to deal with this, uh, this imbalance thing, yeah? So basically this moat, what it does is that for the, the, the classes, which are very, um, they don't have, uh, um, they are very badly represented. Basically it, over, it, it, um, it explodes this class in order to balance the data set, yeah? So this yep. is one of the ways in order to uh, kind of uh, make things a little bit fairer for all the classes, yeah? Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have uh, more questions, please? So one participant may ask more than one question since we have time. Um, Alexei, <laughs> hello Alexei. Okay, okay. Oh, thank you very much for interesting talk. Uh, thank you. Actually, I have two questions and, uh, mm. oh, sorry. You are welcome. Yeah, so, uh, and since I can ask two questions, so I would probably start from like, uh, I would ask both of them. And the first one is actually, I was surprised that there is different metrics about fairness in a sense. Why? Because uh, okay, you, as far as I understand, all this uh, problem about fairness usually happens when uh, there's a kind of punishment and a kind of bad behavior. Like, would it be like credit default or crimes or whatever? It seems to be more or less related to this kind of uh, things. And in this case, it seems like, imagine we have population of, I don't know, cats and dogs. And uh, we don't, population don't like when mouses are eaten. Then basically it seems uh, that those cats that are not going to eat, it would be dishonest if all of them or large proportion of them are punished. Okay, but in contrast, it seems to be a bit strange to control for that uh, few dogs are not punished uh while all cats are punished in a sense so I, I mean if someone is going to be good probably some dishonest behavior is possible but if someone is going to be bad why should we care about honest uh, false positives i guess Yes, so, so thank you very much, Alexei. So I, I will try to, if I quite understood your, uh, your question. So uh, first of all, from the beginning, indeed, this that we are doing actually applies to any setting, yeah? You could be looking into, I don't know, allocation of resources or something like that. So if you are able to, to, to pose the problem in such a way that there is some kind of discrimination or unfair discrimination with respect to subpopulation, then you can use this uh, this approach. And one thing that um, that uh, now I go back to the to the talk. So as you see, many of this uh, many of this not all are about punishing the the bad, and some of them are also kind of giving uh, good uh, good so um, rewards for the for the good. So this this is why we picked. Well, this is just a, a small um, a small. Uh, selection of this uh, fairness metrics. And this is just to, to kind of cover many of the aspects that you could see. So uh, you could uh, look into fairness in the individual um, setting, but you could also look at it in the, in the kind of the, the, the group dimension, you know, like fairness as groups or fairness uh, individual, yeah? So here we try to, to represent several of these aspects that um, could be taken into account. So. And this is why we, 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 we use this in order to cover as much as we can all sorts of um, fairness um, issues that you could see uh, in data and in, uh, in models, yeah? I don't know if I answered your question, but... Um, so here we are, yeah, not making uh, any choices. we are not making any decisions. We are trying to be as neutral as we can. And this is why we considered so many different views on fairness, yeah? Okay, I see. So probably I just don't know some fairness, the tasks where fairness appear and I just have in mind something like crimes or credit defaults. And that's why I, I'm thinking about one or only one possibility. Yeah. You, you know, this unfairness actually comes a lot, and I guess that there will be uh, a talk about this. 
And you know, if you are in a, in a gaming in a game uh, theory perspective, this could be really like uh, local games, or it could be uh, um, you, you know there are several ways of looking at it and how to pose the the, the fairness issue and in a formal way. Yeah, uh, one could be allocation of uh, resources. This this can also yeah. raise some fairness issues. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And actually, if I can, the second question. Um, uh, <clears throat> with respect to your approach, you propose, actually, I have uh, kind of, it seems that when you use an ensemble approach, you basically average, so you have uh, some dishonest model inside, and then you average this dishonest out in a sense which means that you still have this honest model, but it's a kind of... Okay, so the idea, it was the idea here, I can, the idea here, I can explain a little bit. So uh, our original motivation was really process fairness. So we, which is really the dependence on sensitive features. So the, the idea of applying feature dropout was really to decrease the dependence of models on those sensitive features, yeah? And then, uh, but of course, when you do this, you decrease the accuracy. So this is why you apply the, the ensemble because the good aspects of some models in this pool of, model, of um, models which are obtained in this way will be the, the good aspects of others, okay? So this, like this, be able to, to, to kind of uh, do a good compromise between uh, uh, dependence on a sensitive feature and uh, the, the, the accuracy, yeah? But, but this is a very naive approach because it's just a weighted average where the weights are all the same. The, the contributions of each variable is not taken into account, but of course, this should be a true weighted um, aggregation uh, process, yeah? This was just to illustrate the feasibility of this, uh, this approach. Yeah, okay. and uh, how much a model can be dishonest? Sorry? I mean, uh, if, if it seems that the model is still a bit dishonest, what is the, uh, how much we can do for a model to be dishonest? That I have to confess that I didn't consider. I, I, this is something that is also to be uh, taken into account in the, in the future. So. I think that we can play a little bit with these weights in order to control um, or to be able to reach optimal uh, models. But you are right. This is something that we should, if we want to do kind of a, 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 the, the, the analysis, the, the most uh, uh, deep analysis of the thing, we need to consider this type of questions. How far can, um, can uh, how dishonest, how much dishonest the model can be? Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Miguel, uh, for coming and uh, delivering this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, just one comment uh, from my side, uh, since um, uh, I am also part of formal concept analysis community, uh, we already uh, have such interesting notions as stability, uh, but we still do not have fairness. Maybe it would be interesting to bring it to the FC community if it is not yet done or and I'm not informed. And uh, in that respect, it would uh, sound like uh, a slogan, <laughs> egalité, stability, and so on. You know, it's it's a bit of fun. Uh, as for um, interpretability for concept learning, everyone is invited for the talk of Leonard Quida uh, just after uh, the, the, the launch. So thank you very much, Miguel, and uh, I'm pleased, uh, well, pleased that 
Okay. Well, okay. So well, thank yeah. you once again uh, for this night's nice, uh, event, and I I, I will uh, participate, and I'm open to discussions uh, later on. So please. Thank, feel thank you. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. will let you know about the, the other feedback. And actually, what you mentioned about the, the, the using FCA, I also have some interest in FCA, and I think uh -huh. it's a good it's a good idea, of course. And um, and uh, in particular, if you want to identify certain groups and if you want to establish uh, the issues, the fairness issues that should be taken into account, maybe a classification um, in the in the sense of FCA could be very very uh, useful. Yeah. So Alexei is also doing some interesting stuff with uh, mm, in, uh, interesting subgroups, discovery, and he uses mm -hmm. he uses FCA. So uh, we can co collaborate and negotiate. Yes, and collaborate. I would be yeah. most forward that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. And okay. uh, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>